Well, man faces first degree murder charges and the deaths of his parents in West Knox County. Authorities have taken 28 year old Joel Michael Guy Jr. into custody. Guy is a college student in Louisiana. The Knox County Sheriff's Office called the crime scene gruesome. Investigators say the parents suffered multiple stab wounds and were dismembered. The sheriff's office says the couple was last seen Friday. WBIR 10 News anchor Kendall Morris joins us from West Knox County, where the couple's remains were found in their home Monday. Hi, folks. Welcome back. I hope you all are doing okay. Um, this is uh, one of them stories that um, is just... Oh, man, I don't know even know how to begin to tell you. I mean, it's just like good grief. So this happened in 2016. It's the weekend of Thanksgiving. And this dude on the screen here, his name is uh, Joel Guy Jr. And um, he lived in Golden View Lane, not just right outside of Knoxville, Tennessee. And this is his home, or was his home. Now, or actually, it was his parents' home, excuse me. But um, Joel Guy, he decided he wanted to uh, do something really bad to his parents. And the reason he wanted to do something bad to his parents is because they had decided they wanted to kick him out of the house. They wanted to cut him off from all the funding and the money, everything that they have done for him, because it was time for him to be on his own. He was 28 years old, and he was it was time for this, uh, well, I'm going to say freak, to be gone, you know, be out of the house. And uh, so Joe didn't like that. So he came up with a scheme that he was going to, uh, well, he was going to kill his parents. And that's exactly what he did. Yep. Now, I have a, um, a video that I want to uh, show you that, uh, that this is by the, um, the YouTube channel, The uh, Decoder. And boy, they have made a really, really good um, episode about this case. And it is, and I'm going to warn you right now, folks, this is. I mean, I'm not kidding you. It is very, very graphic, okay? Uh, and I'm going to pop on the warning, trigger, trigger warning. So, but uh, it's true events that's happened to sick people in this world. And so here we go. Enforcement officials showing a meat grinder and gas can were found in the trunk of what they say is Guy's car. Guy is a college student in Louisiana. The Knox County Sheriff's Office called the crime scene gruesome. It would be described as horrific, uh, a very gruesome crime scene. What investigators found inside has been dubbed by the state as a diabolical stew. Yeah. Knoxville, Tennessee, November 2016. A loving family spends a peaceful Thanksgiving together with no idea of the horror to come. Joel and Lisa Guy were the loves of each other's lives. Described by those around them as true soulmates, the pair had been happily married for over 30 years. They invited their children to celebrate Thanksgiving in their family home, the same home that two days later would be described by police as a house of horrors. Scattered limbs, the stench of chemicals, and a head found boiling in a pot on the stovetop. Yeah, folks, that's when I saw this on the news in 2016, I was like, are you kidding me? What the hell? Are, what am I looking at? And this is, you know, I don't live very far. I'm in East Tennessee, but I'm not very far from Knoxville. And I am like, I'm a it's just one of these stories that's like it's shocking the hell out of you you know what is going on so this is the horrible story of joel and lisa guy's awful demise so i'm going to uh let me escape it, get out of this um or skip out of this commercial i need you to i'm going to leave the um uh, link to this show and to their channel 
because they are extremely really good. So here we go. Joel Guy was a pipeline engineer born in 1955. He already had three daughters from a previous relationship when he met the love of his life, Lisa. Joel and Lisa went on to have a son together named Joel after his father. Joel Michael Jr. as he was known was born in 1988 and was the couple's only child together. Yet Joel Sr. and Lisa remain close to Joel Sr.'s three daughters, with one of them describing Lisa as a loving mother to them all. Now, uh, Lisa was not your mother, is that correct? Correct. Can you tell the jury uh, when uh, when you met Lisa and how, how that came about? Um, Lisa, when Michelle and I uh, were three, they met and she's been like a second mother to us since before I can remember. <laughs> After 31 happy years of marriage, Joel Sr. had made retirement plans and was selling their house in Knoxville, Tennessee. Joel and Lisa were looking forward to being able to spend more time with each other in retirement. They had bought a house in Sir Goinesville, Tennessee, where they planned to live out their retirement. This was to be Lisa and Joel's last Thanksgiving in their Knoxville family home before their move. Are you aware of Lisa's plans to retire? Uh, yes, she was excited about retiring and just spending her time. They were madly in love, so just spending time with each other. Okay. It would be a celebration of their life together as they look forward to a new chapter. But this new chapter would never arrive. Fast forward to Thursday, November 24th, 2016, Thanksgiving Day. The couple invited Joel Sr.'s three daughters and their children, along with their son, Joel Jr., to celebrate Thanksgiving with them. Joel Jr. was normally reclusive and quiet, but Michelle Tyler, his half-sister, suggests that on this occasion, he was behaving unusually. Michelle states that Joel Jr. made more of an effort with his half-sister's children that Thanksgiving, something he had never done before. Perhaps there was something special about this Thanksgiving, she thought, as the last in the family home. This day was a little different. It's, it was always more, the typical time with Dad and Lisa was more laughing and banter, but if Joel Michael Jr. was there, he wasn't ever hanging with us doing that banter. He yeah, this dude was really, really, uh, he's, he's a really sicko. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, I believe he represented himself. I don't think he wanted a lawyer uh, in his case. He would be in his room. And uh, at some point, did he interact, though, with your children? The Thanksgiving was different. The um, Thanksgiving was completely different. The moment that I um, arrived, Joel Michael Jr. was um, talking to us, and so, and ta he had never, I I'm not sure Joel Michael Jr. knew my kids' names, and so for him to t talk to them was, was odd. She had no idea it would be their last Thanksgiving as a family at all. After the Thanksgiving celebrations were over, Joel Sr.'s three daughters left with their children, and Joel Sr. and Lisa Guy remained in the house with their son, Joel Jr. Joel Jr. had his own apartment in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but remained with his parents after the holiday in their Knoxville home, where he had his own bedroom. Joel had been a student at Louisiana State University for several years. Though he had wanted to be a plastic surgeon, Joel dropped out of college in 2015 and had not had a job since. He was reliant on his parents and financially insecure. On the afternoon of Saturday, 26 November 2016, two days after Thanksgiving, Lisa Guy went out shopping for groceries at their local Walmart. At 3 p.m. the same day, her son, Joel Jr., was seen shopping in the same Walmart buying bandages and chemicals. Okay, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to take you to this Walmart here real quick. Let me, uh, this is what... I mean, the story is just unbelievable, folks. It is just really crazy, crazy. Um, so this is this is the Walmart um, in Knoxville, Tennessee. This is where he was at uh, buying all his a lot of his equipment. There's a couple other places that he went to to uh, buy the crazy stuff that he was um, 
going to use for his to kill his parents but this is the walmart and i have been in this walmart many times because i um, i've done um, event shows and stuff in here and um yeah this is and and this is the walmart where his parents where his mom went in to buy groceries right there and oh lord i tell you this just to think about you know you that's the thing folks when you go to these places you don't you don't even think what the heck is going on you don't know what kind of people you're running into so all right and um the next day sunday november 27 2016 Joel Jr. left the Knoxville house to seek medical aid for cuts he had sustained on his hand, driving back to Baton Rouge to be seen at the student clinic. On their own, neither action was suspicious. But on Monday, November 28th, Lisa Guy failed to show up for work. Her boss, Jennifer White, had begun to worry. The company Lisa worked for was throwing her a retirement party, and she was missing it. She wasn't answering her home phone nor her mobile. Worried for Lisa's safety, Jennifer placed a call to 911, asking for Knox County police officers to do a welfare check on the Guy family. Uh, yes, I have an employee that um, has not reported for work today and highly unlike her. I've tried calling her home number, I've tried calling cell phone and can't get a hold of her. What can we do about that? Can somebody go by and check on them? Yeah, do you know her address? I do, I do. What is that? It, it is Golden View Lane. Okay. And what is your name, ma'am? My name is Jennifer Whited, W-H-I-T-E-D. And what company are you with? Jacobs Engineering. Now this is uh, footage of the policemen coming to the house there. Okay, what's the employee's name? Lisa Guy, G-U-Y. Her husband's name is Joel, J-O-E-L. Should he be there too? Does he live with her? Yes, he does. And they do have a, a dog named Jake. I think he's a big baby. I believe this scene right here you're looking at, folks, is the second time that the police was called at the house. The first time they didn't go into the backyard because they didn't feel like anything was wrong. She is in her, I think, late 50s. Notice he's looking through the door. There's no door handle. Do you know if she has any medical issues? That's crazy. No, I mean, she has high blood pressure, but that's all. That's all that I know of. And I know that their house is for sale, and they are moving, and she is leaving our company, but that's supposed to be Friday, and this definitely isn't like her just not to show up. anything changes before then, just give us a call back here, okay? At the same number? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. The officer undertaking the welfare check was Stephen Ballard, who went up to the guy's family home and rang the doorbell, but did not receive a response. He went around to the back of the house, but realized the gate was locked and didn't take any further action. Yeah, so that's the first time. But Lisa's boss remained concerned. An hour or two later, she called 911 a second time to ask for another welfare check. Detective Stephen Ballard went a second time to the house, this time with Detective Jeremy McCord. Looking through the window, they saw groceries, including perishable items such as milk and bacon, scattered all over the floor, and even though the house was for sale, there was no real estate agent lock on the door. They also noted that the back doorknob was missing. Hi. Yeah. So 
as you can see, I mean, that this is just crazy, the stuff that's going on. I'm just going to let this commercial play and then we'll go back to this. Um, but yeah, crazy, crazy stuff. Court eventually gained access through the garage door as they entered. So, this is the second time that the police were called. Um, um, because the lady at work where uh, Mrs. Guy was supposed to show up to work and she didn't, uh, they were real concerned. So they called 911 back again. And this is what the police encountered in, in this house. And boy, folks, trigger warning, gross. It's gruesome. They felt an intense heat. This was the first chilling sign of the horror that lay within. There were three cases of beer, perishables, there was uh, breakfast meat, stuff like that in bags that you, you could just see sitting there. And then immediately to the right is a formal dining room that had a, a large amount of uh, long guns laying there. Um, I think there was a red velvet cake at the end of the table. Uh, it's just stuck out. And so take, taking into account everything you've witnessed thus far, uh, the circumstances mm -hmm. present outside as well as what you observed inside, uh, how are you feeling at this point? It's terrifying because you don't know if somebody needs some help. I mean, it's just an odd situation. There's nothing downstairs that I'm observing that that makes sense to me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we we go through houses and we clear houses regularly, and most of the time, if you if you encounter something, you kind of know right when you get in. This was a, a very different situation because once we get upstairs, it's like the world does a 180. Okay. Everything gets turned upside down. Yeah, this is like a house of horror, if you want to say. I mean, that really, tr truly is. Inside the house, there were guns lined up on the dining room table. The smell of chemicals in the house was so strong that Ballard said his forehead was tingling in the toxic air. I actually feel a tingling on my forehead from the time that I entered the home. Um, as we continue on and start up the steps, the, the heat is more intense. It's, it seems to be getting hotter. Disturbed by these signs, they feared the worst. And upstairs, their fears were confirmed. The officers found a horrifying sight. A pair of human hands lying at the end of the hallway. Yep. I see a, a human hand. It was lying in an upright position with another human hand that was closed fist behind it. And downstairs, something even worse waited in the kitchen. The officers had entered a true horror show. Realizing they could not proceed without backup, they left the property. There was no one physically present in the house. No one alive. Backup was soon called, and forensic investigators arrived at the scene. On entering the house, they saw a large stockpot sat on the stovetop, which was hot. The forensics team also found reddish-brown stains up the stairs, on the walls, and on the banister. But the most grisly evidence of all was found in the bathroom. In addition to a weapon in the bathroom sink, they found two blue tubs that contained liquid and pieces of flesh. Nearly every room of the home was filled with evidence. Chemicals and weapons lay about the house and blood was found everywhere. But the occasional third resident, their son, Joel Jr., was nowhere to be found in the house. He was still alive. The police placed Joel Jr. under surveillance. As the only survivor, he became the only suspect and was apprehended on Tuesday, November 29, 2016 in Baton Rouge. A meat grinder was found in the trunk of his car. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Can you imagine, folks? I mean, the police know what was going on, or they, you know, when they stumbled in on this, um, the scene, and then when this dude gets pulled over, or they open his car trunk, they see a meat grinder and this is a very very sick individual so what happened to lisa and joel guy senior it was clear they had been killed and their own son was the number one suspect but why in a backpack inside the house officers found a startling piece of evidence 
a black notebook used by Joel Jr. This notebook was the key to the deaths of Lisa and Joel Guy Sr. In fact, he'd written checklists detailing equipment he needed and steps he would have to take in order to kill his parents. Minimize things I touch throughout visit. Wear gloves and socks to prevent fingerprints and footprints. Drop something down the garbage disposal to break it. Get him on the ground fixing it. Clean up mess from him before she gets home. Bring blender and food grinder. Grind meat. The notebook, crazy, crazy. nicknamed the Book of Premeditation, showed that Joel Jr. had been planning this murder for days, if not weeks. You see, folks, I remember this so well, watching the news every day with this. And when I saw this dude and how he was acting and what I knew of that, what he had done, um, I mean, just the look on his face was just pure evil. I mean, it's just like, and he, he didn't show any emotion throughout the trial. I mean, I didn't see any emotion but this was definitely this was a cold-blooded killer right here just crazy as early as november 7th nearly 20 days before the murders cctv footage shows joel jr shopping for items he would later use for the murders yeah and that this is that walmart that i showed you such as hydrogen peroxide this is video of the male subject entering our grocery vestibule on November 26, 2016 at 326 p.m. His internet history similarly shows searches for different chemicals such as sodium percarbonate, the active ingredient in OxyClean. Joel's plan was to end the lives of both of his parents and make it look like his father had done it. Joel Jr. planned to clean the crime scene and partially burn the house in an attempt to destroy evidence. He also wrote notes about the temperature of the house, stating that he would turn the thermostat up as high as it would go to further remove any evidence of his heinous crimes. As these pieces of evidence were revealed, the timeline of events began to become clear. And here's one from November 26, 2016 at 1218, uh, 18 minutes after noon at the 10,900 Parkside Drive Walmart, um, detailing uh, the items purchased or uh, consistent with what was uh, observed. And uh, Can you imagine what this register person is thinking after finding out about this? Because you know she knows that she was the one that was checking him out. But she didn't know what was going on, of course. But that's just it, folks. When we interact with people, um, you just never know. And I, I know that's got to be crazy, but man. And documented at the Golden View address in the foyer. On Saturday, November 26th, Lisa Guy went shopping. Left at home with his father, Joel Jr. attacked Joel Sr. in the upstairs exercise room. Police officers noted that the room was a mess, suggesting Joel Sr. fought for his life, but his son overpowered him and attacked him with a knife over 40 times. Lisa Guy arrived home just after midday. She walked into the house carrying the groceries she had just bought with no idea of the horror she was returning to. Perhaps she heard a sound from upstairs or saw some signs of her son's violent turn. Lemonade, pet. Yeah, crazy, 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 and um, insurance. But um, skip through this commercial here. Um, yeah, that boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Trees all over the floor and ran upstairs, but she was too late to save her husband. Instead, her son attacked and killed her. She sustained at least 31 stab wounds. Joel placed his mother's head in a stock pot and set it on the stove, turning the stock pot on so his mother's head would boil. Can you believe this shit? What the hell, folks? Man. Having obtained a deep... And look at this, this asshole. He just sits there. He's just like, oh, uh, um, 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 um. 
am I going to be able to watch Captain Kangaroo or when when y'all going to let me go back to my room? Oh. Cut on his left thumb during the attack on his father, Joel Jr. left the scene to go to Walmart, where he was seen at 3.30 p.m. buying bandages, ointment, and more chemicals. It had been just over three hours since Lisa Guy was in Walmart buying groceries for the family. Now, Joel Jr. was shopping in the same Walmart, and both his mother and father were dead. Tragically, upon hearing the news that her daughter had been murdered, Lisa Guy's elderly mother collapsed and was taken to the hospital. She died the day before her daughter's funeral. Lee Isn't that awful, folks? Just think about that. Another death in the family. Lisa's Damn. brother stated in court that his mom was heartbroken. But to find out your daughter was murdered by your own grandchild was heartbreaking. My mother died. There are three deaths on your hand on Joe Michael Guy Jr.'s hands. It's like he don't even damn care. He's just waiting to go back to his room or something. It's like, oh. On that day, I lost my family. My mother is gone. My sister is gone. The world has forever changed. The impact of this crime is notorious. My grandchildren's grandchildren will be able to read about this horrible, disgusting crime. We will never, ever be the same. The evidence stacked up against Joel Jr. as the case came to trial, yet he pleaded not guilty. Evidence from family and from Joel Jr.'s notebook showed that his motive was financial. Joel Guy Jr. had been financially supported by his parents for his whole life, with Lisa working tirelessly in order to give the majority of her paychecks to her son. Yet as they were nearing their retirement, the couple decided it was time for their 28-year-old son to stand on his own two feet and plan to cut him off financially. Joel Jr. had guessed what was happening and was not happy. Realizing that his parents would no longer support him, Joel hatched a plan. He thought that if both of his parents were dead, he would be able to access their $500,000 life insurance policy. On top of this, Joel Jr. would have access to his parents' other assets, such as their cars and their boat. Can you believe this, folks? Over friggin ass money this stupid asshole kills his parents over money holy cow damn for most of us hurting any of our family members is inconceivable but joel jr not only killed the two people who loved and supported him the most but he did it for money Joel Sr.'s family members took to the stand to confirm he had been planning to cut his son off financially. Joel Sr. had been planning to tell Joel Jr. that coming Christmas, which the family would have celebrated in their new Segoinsville home, had their lives not been cut tragically short. Well, the week before, they were at the house, and we were talking about what they were going to do, and they said that they were going to wait till Christmas to talk to Joel Michael, that they were going to have to have him to start paying his bills and stuff you know i'm wondering if they already knew that their son was you know wacko crazy i'm pretty sure they did i mean you know you're you know your child you know you don't sometimes know how dangerous they really are but i i feel like when i heard this that yeah they they knew and they wanted to just uh you know get him out and get him away from their selves i believe but and this was a close family. They like to talk. And uh, they discuss these plans. And you, uh, you just can bet that Lisa Guy, who was Mr. Uh, Joel Guy Jr.'s uh, biggest fan, his enabler, his supporter, you know that she told him. She had to tell him in advance what, was, what he was in for, what was coming up for him. You know that happened. If they're talking about it with Michelle and Angela and Joel Sr. sisters in October and November, you know that the defendant knew about it and you know that his mother told him. So he knew what was coming. And he's smart. He's smart enough to know that uh, once his mom retires, once she quits her job, that insurance money is gone. He isn't getting that. He's not getting that. 
And, uh, and he's not used to supporting himself. He's used to having the support and uh, care uh, from his mother, primarily, taking care of his needs, providing him with an apartment, with utilities, with a car, gas money, paying his bills, his tuition, paying for his books, paying for everything. He's used to having her pay for everything. And he wasn't about to let them cut him off. A further, You know, that's what pissed me off about this whole case when I heard about all this. And I'm like, man, what an ass, what a freak, what a sorry piece of scum person. Not even human. I don't even call this human, really. I, I just call it a monster uh, in a human skin, right? Um, but, I mean, his mom and dad paid for everything for him. And first of all, I don't agree with that. I think when your child is old enough uh, to get out of the home, kick them out. Get them out as early as possible. Get them working. Uh, doing something for theirself and get them on the, out the door. You know, let them come and visit, uh, help them out if they need it, you know, if you can. Um, but, boy, yeah, this this dude was a sick individual. Grim detail was explained by Michelle Tyler, Joel Jr.'s half-sister. She stated that she had seen the blue containers in Joel Michael Jr.'s car during their Thanksgiving celebrations two days before the murders. These blue containers would be the ones into which Joel Jr. would place chemicals and parts of his parents' bodies. Day two of the trial, Tuesday, September 29th, saw footage of Joel Jr. in Walmart, just hours after the deaths of his parents, where he was purchasing bandages and plasters to put over the cut on his thumb he sustained after he attacked his dad. On the video, you can see that um, he has what appears to be bandages um, uh, covering some type of injury on his on his right and left hands. More photos and videos from this house Crazy of things. horrors were also shown. The pot that contained Lisa Guy's head was also shown to the court. Multiple items in the house used for the murder had Joel Jr.'s fingerprints on them. Officers came to the stand to further describe what they found. One officer described the smell, stating that he would never be able to get that smell out of his head. Throughout these graphic descriptions, Joel Jr. sat emotionless, not reacting to the horrific testimonies being given by Knox County police officers. In a case where somebody is charged with premeditated murder, and I've tried many premeditated homicides, uh, you know, usually you have to put premeditation together circumstantially. And many times I have argued to a jury that you will have to put facts A, B, C, D, and E together uh, to prove this element of premeditation. It's not like you'll have a, a notebook or an outline or a diary entry that's going to tell you every time. And uh, how ironic that in, uh, I finally got a case where, uh, where there, I have that. That's exactly what we have. We have basically what amounts to a diary that outlines a plan of intention uh, to kill. And we have a motive. Each new detail presented in court revealed the depths of Joel's cruelty. Yeah, this is a sick, sick puppy. Um, yeah, I mean, he, he wrote out everything, but what gets me to, folks, is that he sat there Thanksgiving weekend with all his family, knowing that he was planning to do this. How horrible. Wow. On the third day of the trial, a further forensic investigator described how they removed the liquefying bodies from the property, describing the way the flesh of Joel Guy Sr.'s head had been entirely eaten away by the acid solution, leaving it skeletonized. Joel Jr.'s only friend and old roommate also spoke to the jury. Michael McCracken, who met Joel Jr. at school, had been friends with Joel for nearly 10 years. He described Joel Jr. as a socially awkward person who was becoming more of a recluse the older he got. 
A phone call between the two after Joel Jr. had been arrested was played for the court, in which Joel said that Michael was the only good thing in his life. I don't know what to say. I'm all of that aside, I am angry and lost and confused and disappointed and upset. And morning you like your day, but now I'm talking to you on the phone and I don't. It's taking everything I have to process and maintain my sanity. I think of you all the time. Joel Jr. had sat through the delivery of horrific evidence and the heartbreaking testimonies from family and friends of his murdered parents. Yet this moment, seeing his best friend in court, was the only time Joel Jr. showed emotion in the trial. The fourth day of the trial, a Thursday, saw the beginning of deliberations. Joel Guy Jr. turned down the opportunity to testify, and the charges against him were read out again. I feel like you've been giving enough advice from us that you're on the business. And um, have you made a decision? Yes. Come on and serve. And you do understand, if you wanted to, regardless of what your attorneys advise you, that you certainly could. That decision is completely yours. You understand that, Mr. Guy? And so it's your decision after being informed and discussing this with your attorneys to not testify in this case. Is that correct? All right. Thank you, sir. Finally, on Friday, October 2nd, 2020, Joel Guy Jr. was found guilty on all charges, including two counts of first-degree murder. Good. Three counts of first-degree felony murder. Good. And two counts of abuse of a corpse. Good. Joel God. was found unanimously guilty on all seven counts, with over 700 pieces of evidence shown to the court. Joel Michael Guy Jr. remains in prison and is incarcerated at the Northwest Correctional Complex in Tiptonville, Tennessee. His sentence will last for 124 years, and he'll be eligible for parole on April 30th, 2136. What are your thoughts on this tragic and heartbreaking story? Well, I can tell you what my thoughts is, is that this some bitch, you know, um, I don't know why he didn't get the death penalty. Um, I, I don't know. They may have not have had it at the time. I think they've changed it in Tennessee or something. They had it and then they didn't have it and they brought it back, something like that. But the fact that this sucker did all this to his family is just so sad. But folks, uh, I thought I'd bring this story to you and I am going to leave the link to uh, this YouTube channel uh, the the decoder they are really good they have a lot of um, different uh, episodes and stuff on their channel and uh, definitely check them out because they have a lot of a lot of crime true crime all kind of uh, stuff that uh, that we all uh, hear about in the news and stuff and a lot of cases that we don't hear about and that's why I wanted to bring this one uh, to you because this is one of them cases a lot of people just really had never, I mean, never heard of, but is, and even as gross and gruesome as it is, you know, it's just so, so sad about the family and prayers to the family. Well, folks, I want to thank you so much for watching. I hope all of you have a good evening and please be safe and give a loved one a hug and tell them you love them because you just never know. And folks, until next time, this is George, and we'll see you down the road. Bye-bye.